Hey there! In today's video, we're diving into the world of cameras, specifically how a camera works and the differences between a Polaroid camera and an iPhone camera. We're going to look at these two devices and see why the photos taken on these cameras look so incredibly different. In recent years, Polaroid film cameras have seen a huge resurgence in popularity. Creatives, photography enthusiasts, and social media content creators alike are drawn to the vintage, organic look of film photos. From purchasing top-of-the-line film cameras to chasing new trends in Polaroid technology with brands like Fujifilm and Polaroid, it seems like the public can't get enough of these classic cameras. With both film and Polaroid cameras, creators can create beautifully unique, faded photography that captures a very unique aesthetic. Unlike iPhones with their usual over-sharpened, processed look, Film cameras have a very texturized depth and distinct color blend to them without any editing. But how? How does this happen for a Polaroid and not an iPhone? What are actually the mechanics of taking a photo on these devices? Well, let's dive in. The way that cameras record an image is by capturing and recording light. White light is actually the combined wavelengths of the colored spectrum of visible light. White light can be broken down into three primary colors, red, green, and blue light. We are able to see the world around us because rays of light are illuminating a subject, hitting that object, and then its correlated color is being reflected back into our eyes. It gets a little technical, but there's a great resource linked in the description below that breaks down light and color. To simplify it, think of an object having a unique composition. When light strikes it, light will be absorbed, but some light will bounce back, and that unique frequency of light is color to us. Remember that because we're gonna come back to that. When that frequency of light is reflected back into our eyes, rods and cones in our eyeballs detect this and translate it into our brains as color. But how do we build a machine that can permanently capture that blend of colors and light into a static image? How do we document that moment? Light is elusive, transitory in both a wave and a particle. How do you create it into a physical reflection of the world around us? The answer, the camera. A camera is defined as a device for recording visual images in the form of photographs, film, or video signals. In a camera, you will have a lens and a target. A target could be photosensitive film or an electronic sensor. When you are ready to take a photo, you press the shutter button and it temporarily opens the shutter so that light can be projected onto a target. But how does this target permanently record this image? We record this image with translating the amount of light into the scene. Sounds easy, right? Well, let's refresh your chemistry and your physics to sort of understand the mechanics of this process. With the invention of film cameras, either black and white or colored film, photographic film is the target. The film is light sensitive and it captures the light in a very ingenious way. It is silver halide emulsion film. What that is, is that the film has silver halide crystalline structures suspended in gelatin over celluloid, celluloid acetate, or polyester. When you look at a film photo and notice its grainy look, it's because of those structures that it looks that way. The way that film works is that the light bouncing off colored objects in the scene that you're photographing hits the film and then those silver halide structures undergo a physical change. To understand the basic principles, let's look at black and white film in black and white photography. When we photograph a scene, the shutter opens, light floods the film, and photons, which are particles of light, come into contact with silver halide crystal structures on the film. Now a photon excites the structure and an electron is ejected from the valence band of the halide into the conducting band of the crystal. This electron then combines with the moving silver ion, forming atomic silver. The place where this occurs is a latent image center. 
this process of turning a silver ion into a silver atom needs to happen about three or four more times so that it is necessary that the latent image center is stable. Now this is important. The latent image is invisible to the eye in the camera, but when you develop the film, these latent images will be amplified and stabilized in order to make negative. It will be no longer light sensitive, so we're able to create visible dark areas where there was light. The amount of silver atoms produced is proportional to the amount of exposed light. More light equals more dark parts on the film negative. When you're finished, you have a negative image of the original scene. That's where film negative name comes from. Since black and white film can only detect light and not specific colors of light, they are tonal representations rather than colored representations. Now you have this negative and you need to turn it into a positive. You can achieve this by scanning your own negatives yourself, taking them elsewhere to be scanned and printed, or making your own prints. Now that's pretty amazing, right? With color photography, it's a bit more complicated. Colored film uses the same silver halide crystals, just like in black and white photography. But to detect color, the film has three layers of emulsion, each with different light sensitive dye mixed in with the silver halide. These three layers of emulsion only capture either red, green, or blue light when exposed to light, almost acting as a filter. What's tricky about this process is that we have to find a way to record light and then turn that representation into pigment. But those two things behave differently. What you need to know first is that additive is light, red, blue, and green but we also have secondary additive colors. These combinations create cyan, magenta, and yellow. This is where subtractive color comes in. Subtractive color is pigment. For subtractive, cyan, magenta, and yellow are the primary colors. Their secondary colors are red, blue, and green. And then when you look to combine them all together, instead of white, you get black. Fun fact, printers actually use subtractive primary colors for color printing. The combination of these three primary pigments creates all visible light colors. So that's exactly what we're gonna need to do to translate light into pigment. While well, using the basic ideas of what we learned in the beginning of the video about colored light acting as a wavelength being absorbed in certain quantities and reflected out, that means we have to find a way to capture that specific color combinations of light and capture it into our photo. Think of film as an elevator. The light will enter at the top and then travel down. We want the color of light to get off at their appropriate level and mark how much intensity is there in the scene. So we're gonna have blue markers at the top, green in the middle, and red at the bottom. So that way we have all the primary colors of additive light captured. Through a brilliant system of using opposite colors to filter, the creators of film found that certain subtractive color dyes in layers catch our desired primary additive colors and filter the rest of the colored light down the film. The silver halide crystals are coated in light sensitive dye so that blue sensitive layers have yellow colored dye and green layers have magenta colored dye. Red sensitive layers have cyan colored dye and only that color can get off at that appropriate level and the rest of the light is filtered through. So we open the shutter and light comes in. The light reaction happens on each layer. The silver ions are changed into silver atoms and the colored film is developed, goes through multiple chemical processes and eventually only leaves the colored dye left on the exact spot where the silver had been activated due to the light concentration. So now you have a negative color image of your scene. It looks crazy because of the odd color pigments and the orange mask that results in improved color production. But now all you have to do is inverse the image. You can do this by scanning your negatives yourself, 
taking them elsewhere for scanning and printing, or even making your own prints. Color correction can be done in several ways using either levels, curves, or color balance tools in either the scanning software or some sort of post-processing software. That's how you do it, and it's an amazing process. But so much work. But then something amazing happened. The Polaroid camera was created. In a Polaroid camera, the process happens within 10 minutes or so. Like before, you have the light sensitive silver halide layer on the back, you take the picture, it develops the negative, and then it binds with dye, forming a positive image. And so this whole process of development happens in just the film. When you eject the film from the Polaroid camera, there's a black layer that's automatically on top. That's protecting the film from receiving any further light since it's light sensitive for the next 10 to 20 seconds. You put your photo down in a dark place for about 10 minutes and then it's fully developed. That's how you get that grainy watercolor-esque look in Polaroid cameras. All right, now that I've explained that, let's break down how an iPhone takes a photo. When the light enters through the camera lens, the target in the iPhone camera is a complementary metal oxide semiconductor or CMOS sensor. A CMOS sensor is a silicone-based sensor that receives light, photons, and will convert the photons into electrons, then into a voltage, and then into a digital value using an on-chip analog to digital converter, ADC. In the image sensor, it is made up of pixels that detect light. In the iPhone 15 Pro, the sensor has 48 megapixels in its sensor, which translates into 48 million pixels. A micro lens and a Bayer mosaic color filter is on top of the sensor. This filter pattern uses 50% green, 25% red, and 25% blue. In each pixel, there's a photodiode. A photodiode absorbs photons and converts that absorbed energy into electricity. The iPhone then documents the electrical current row by row. The analog to digital converter interprets the electrical current into a digital value. The information then gets sent to the CPU for processing, and then it's stored in a solid state drive in the form of zeros and ones. But what's really important about this process is how the iPhone interprets color. Semiconductor pixels don't see color. They only capture the amount of light that hits them. The Bayer Mosaic color filter, which are the proverbial colored glasses, see color. The Bayer filter makes sure that each pixel sees at least one of the three primary colors. Since each pixel of the sensor is behind a colored filter, an algorithm is needed to estimate the color of each individual pixel. This process is called demosaicing. A simple demosaicing algorithm will average the input of the nearby pixels to obtain an idea of the full color of the full picture. In the newest models of iPhone, they use the quad Bayer structure, which means there's four adjacent pixels clustered with the same colored filter. This creates more sensitivity and higher resolution. It produces brighter and sharper images by working as a larger sensor. How it does this is by pixel binning, basically using four pixels to act as one with greater surface area for light capture. But what this means is that the 48 megapixel sensor will leave you with a 24 megapixel photo, but it optimizes for light capture and color accuracy. You can bypass this demosaicing and pixel binning by shooting raw. This contains all the raw, unprocessed sensor information and retains the buyer pattern exactly how it was originally captured. So as you can see, taking a photo is not a cut and dry process. It has so much to do with the interpretation of light and color, and that's what makes it absolutely mind boggling and spectacular. So now that you know the difference between film and a CMOS filter, Let's see the physical differences of photographing the exact same scene on a Polaroid versus an iPhone. I'm shooting with the Polaroid Now Plus second generation, which allows you to use an app to manually adjust the settings. The film that I'm using for this camera is the iType color film. On the iPhone, I'm shooting with the iPhone 15 Pro Max, and I will shoot with the pixel binning on so you can see the natural default of the camera. So without further ado, let's shoot.
So here we have the photos that I took at both Old Town and Sunset Cliffs. I printed out the iPhone photos with the Kodak Step Instant Mobile Printer so you could see how the colors look printed out as well. After looking at all these photos, the real takeaway I found is that the faded, nostalgic look of the Polaroid photos is really visually appealing. The muted colors, the crushed blacks, and the grainy texture really give this dreamy look that is actually really fun to experience. It's almost like my eyes can gaze deeper into the picture and easier to scan for the little details and little imperfections as well. The Polaroids feel almost like paintings. Softer depictions of the scene and the blending of the colors seem more natural compared to that of the iPhone. Looking at the iPhone shots, they are still really enjoyable to look at, but the contrast of the colors and the intense saturation has my eyes pulled in many different directions. It's like every spot of the photo is important and sharp and it's competing for my attention. So while I found the Polaroid shots to be more beautiful than the iPhone when I was shooting at Old Town, the complete opposite happened at Sunset Cliffs. The Polaroids could not handle the low light at sunset. Even when I adjusted the settings in the app, with the added cloud cover, the camera really couldn't capture much of the scene compared to that of the iPhone, which easily exposed both the foreground and the background of each photo. Since we know how the iPhone sensor works, it's no surprise that it was really easy to shoot in low light. We hope you enjoyed this video and it helped you see the differences between an iPhone camera and a Polaroid camera. If you have any questions, make sure you drop a comment in the section below. Thanks for watching and happy shooting.